of the Veterans Recorded History Program, and um, today is February the 25th, and I'm speaking with Carol Grinnell. We're glad to have you here. My name is Carol Calkins Grinnell, C-A-R-R-O-L-L. Calkins is C. A-L-K-I-N-S, Grinnell, G-R-I-N-N-E-L-L. I was born in uh, Schenectady, New York, in uh, July 21st, 1921. I grew up in Japan as a child because my father went out to the Philippine, to Japan <clears throat> as an electrical engineer for the General Electric Company. And I was two when we went out there in 1923. Um, I spent my childhood there until 1933 uh, going to school. And then my father was transferred to Manila, Philippine Islands. And uh, I was there briefly and then uh, went home to the United States in 1934 uh, to become uh, uh, to actually go to school at a country day school in Albany, New York. It was the Albany Academy. I uh, went from there to Amherst College and uh, graduated on a speed up course in um, February, actually January 31st, 1943. And uh, two, uh, two weeks later was inducted into the Army as an enlisted man. And because of my residence in Japan and some knowledge of the language, was uh, tapped by the Army to go into the military intelligence training service at the uh, University of Michigan. And at the University of Michigan, uh, went through that, uh, actually starting in several places, Camp Savage, Minnesota, and then the East Quadrangle at the University of Minnesota. Um, and then halfway through the course, it was discovered that I was limited service. And in those days, to lead a team of Nisei Japanese uh, Americans, second generation Americans, to the Far East, you had to be full service. And uh, full service meant no glasses. Well, I wore glasses, so I did not qualify to be commissioned. However, the commandant of the uh, intelligence school uh, transferred me to the military intel or to the medical administration corps and uh, their uh, OCS at Camp Barkley, Texas. And at Camp Barkley, Texas, uh, uh, graduated uh, as a 90-day wonder and uh, was transferred out to uh, the Regional Station Hospital at Fort Ord, O-R-D, uh, California. Uh, this institution has been dismantled and no longer exists. But I was out there until uh, I uh, was discharged. Actually, I entered service uh, February 14th, uh, 1943, and was discharged in June of 1946. I do not know the exact date, but uh, during that time uh, the, that I was in the Army, I spent most of the time out in uh, the Regional Station Hospital, first as a dental supply officer and then ultimately as a uh, personnel officer at the hospital. Um, at the time, I was married uh, to my first wife, who was a uh, gunnery instructor, uh, a WAVE uh, in the Navy. And uh, her experience there was quite uh, uh, interesting at uh, Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay. Uh, because at that time, the people she was training for the Navy were stationed on freighters um, with uh, anti-aircraft gun guns uh, as a protection. And many of those ships were sunk. And uh, the same people that she had trained once came back. And it was a very depressing time. The most interesting thing, I think, about my history has to do with my father because at the outbreak of the war, 
uh, in, on December 7th with the Japanese. Um, he was in the Philippines, and uh, the records show that uh, Manila was captured on December 9th, just two days uh, later. Um, he was scheduled to come home uh, at, to the United States, but uh, the Pan American Clipper ship that he was scheduled to go on was machine gunned and sunk by the Japanese in uh, uh, Hong Kong Harbor. So he was interned uh, at Santa Tomas, that's T-O-M-A-S, University in Manila. And he uh, was in there for three and a half years. Um, uh, and his position there was civilian commandant of the, the camp, who had anywhere from four to 6,000 people in it. And he was um, uh, also uh, surreptitiously uh, getting money, uh, company money, which he had uh, uh, he had hidden away at the time of his internment. He was using this to buy uh, food and drugs for the internees. And as the war wore on, uh, he was not able to. Um, uh, keep from the Japanese the fact that th he was supplying this. So the Japanese executed him um, in January of 1945, just prior to uh, MacArthur recapturing Manila, <clears throat> which was a very tragic thing. Um, he received the Medal of Freedom posthumously, which was given to my mother by General Hodges. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, a bit of history that uh, my brother uh, keeps as a record of, of his experiences. He saved a lot of lives, didn't he? He saved uh, probably, uh, I don't know how many lives, but uh, he certainly made it as comfortable as possible for the people that were uh, in the camp. Uh, the camp itself was a very difficult place because there was not room in the university quarters for any, uh, any privacy at all. And in the yard is what they did. They had their little hooches, H-O-O-C-H-E-S, <laughs> which were uh, places where people could do their own thing, where they could cook or do whatever uh, with uh, food and uh, have some small degree of privacy. But this is the sad state of affairs that went on for um, three and a half years. And there have been many books written about this. And I'm sure that the Library of Congress has uh, these the copies. I have some myself. When you were growing up, uh, did you speak Japanese? Uh, as a child, it's very easy to learn language. And uh, even uh, without language, uh, children learn to play together. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, uh, I spoke some Japanese, and I recently went back to Japan <clears throat> in May of 2003 to see it for the first time in uh, 70 years that I had left, since I'd left. Um, it was very interesting, very uh, uh, enlightening, because as a child, I would never have seen the places that we went on this tour. Uh, because my father had business and he would never take his son on trips like that. So that was very interesting. And uh, yes, I still speak some Japanese. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that was uh, utilized when you were in the service. No, because uh, what I did in the University of Michigan was to study uh, military aspects of uh, Japanese, <clears throat> which had to do with the weapons that they used, the nomenclature for weapons and uh, uh, ranks of the uh, military Japanese. It's called Heigo, H-E-I-G-O. Heigo is uh, military Japanese. And uh, so you learned that. Uh, I think at one time I knew 600 kanji, K-A-N-J-I, which are the characters uh, that uh, Japanese and Chinese characters are uh, uh, quite almost uh, similar, but uh, they're pronounced differently by the Chinese and the Japanese. I don't 
think anything's been recorded about the Japanese weaponry. Uh, I never got into the field, so I can't say that I recall anything specific about it, but uh, they, they taught you a great deal about the mentality of the Japanese as well as the, uh, the mechanical aspects of the weaponry and so forth. And I've always wondered just on my own, with a little bitty country so far away, and the size it is here, what was the mentality? I know they had to do what they were told. Well, the Japanese had a code of honor, which was called Bushido. That's B-U-S-H-I-D-O. Bushido is a code of honor which, if respected properly, uh, would not only have great honor and respect for women and particularly children, Japanese are very fond of children, but the Japanese at the time of the war had been perverted by the uh, militant people like Tojo and, and so forth, General Tojo. And they had perverted this to make the uh, Japanese soldiers much more um, if you will, aggressive, fear, uh, fearsome, and so forth. Uh, and they taught that uh, it would be a dishonor to the family and to uh, the country to be captured alive, which accounts for so many of the uh, big battles where thousands were killed in the Far East because the Japanese were not uh, able to surrender under the code that they'd been short, uh, taught. But this was, that particular time and place was a total perversion of the Bushido Code of Honor, which was, of course, done way back um, when the Japanese were uh, in charge of their island. Of course, Japan changed when the Meiji uh, regime uh, was uh, uh, put in after Perry opened up the Japanese uh, country in 1858 when uh, Perry and his ships came to 1958. Japan. Mm -hmm. 1858. Mm -hmm. That's when the Meiji regime started and when the enlightenment of uh, the Japanese to the Western world uh, started. It that was been a big change, I must It was, say. yes, a big change. Of course, the Japanese had started I guess with the first visits of the Portuguese back in 1543, uh, when the Portuguese were shipwrecked in Japan, um, not too far from Nagasaki, and that, I know that. <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's a lot of history behind that, and uh, the Japanese were always they always had their emperors because the emperor is in their light a god, and but politically speaking, there was a lot of, of uh, uh, you might say, politicians who are the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the other lords. Well, the samurai, of course, were attached to these various uh, lords. I wish I could remember the name of, of that, but I'll think of it. Um, so the, 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 they, they were, there were uh, uh, Japanese uh, bands or clans, you might say, which ruled different parts of Japan. And the samurai were the arms and legs of the uh, local rulers uh, to uh, keep control. And the main, in those feudal days, the main uh, uh, currency was rice because rice was, if you could have more rice fields, which is why the uh, territorial uh, battles started to gain control of the land which produced rice, and the more rice you produced, the more you are uh, respected and your power is greater. This is what happened in the feudal days. They didn't carry money, they carried rice. Well, they had forms of money, but rice was really the underlying currency. It's like gold right. uh, for the uh, Japanese. And that's why to this day, we have never really been able to export our rice, which is much uh, 
we have larger harvests and the price of our rice is far less than the Japanese because of the efficiency and the fact that we can uh, produce it. But Japan's a little country. It's very mountainous, very um, small in comparison to the productive fields that we have. I that saw product. an economic article where they said the Japanese would reject ours as not being quality, but mainly it was sort of uh, protectionist. It's a protectionist thing um, because if we would flood the, the com uh, country with our rice, we'd have a lot of people put out of, of uh, work. They wouldn't have anything to produce. Of course, the country's been totally uh, uh, changed into a uh, commercialized operation now with all of its manufacturing and so forth. What did you think of present-day Japan? Well, going back after all this time has been a uh, revelation in a lot of ways, but on the other hand, you recall things and you respect what you've seen as, as part of history. And uh, uh, we went to a gold mine on the island of Sado, S-A-D-O, which uh, is where the prisoners that were exiled had to work in the very hot and sweaty gold mines uh, bringing up gold. We saw a lot of things that I would never obviously have seen as a child. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, let's see, Fort Ord. Station Hospital, and you were there during the year service years. Yes, actually, after I uh, after I was commissioned at, at Camp Barkley, Texas, we went to Fort Douglas for re uh, for uh, assignment, and from there went out to Fort Ord. And Fort Ord is was a huge uh, armored. Uh, camp. This was essentially for um, field artillery and armed uh, armory tanks. And uh, it is, as I say, is no longer in existence. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us about a couple of your own memorable experiences? Uh, you did not have to go overseas. You were I was not, uh, yeah, because I, I could not uh, be a part of the military intelligence. Uh, the, the concept of uh, military intelligence in the Far East was that you would be attached to a regiment or uh, a division or an army, whatever, to do interrogation of Japanese prisoners. And then, ultimately, if Japan were to be uh, occupied, to be a part of AMG, American Military Government. Uh, of course, none of this happened, but that was the concept. Uh, they uh, commissioned quite a few people uh, in this uh, service. A lot of them were Harvard graduates and um, people who had studied Japanese or been in Japan. And uh, I met up with uh, a couple of my classmates at different times <laughs> in the same thing. That must have been interesting, too. Uh, I don't want to leave out any of the important things. How did you stay in touch with your family? Well, um, as far as my father was concerned, he sent us several heavily censored postcards. That was about the limitation. Uh, of course, not going abroad, um, letters or phone calls were the way to go for contact. And uh, do you recall the day your service ended? Um, it ended actually in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. I had hoped at that time to um, be discharged in California because uh, it would have been, at that time, an excellent place to go, but could not get any particular employment out there. I think I did get an offer for uh, to be a, a small newspaper uh, correspondent, 
I think the pay at that point offering was $35 a week, but uh, I couldn't figure how to do that because we had a baby on the way, my wife and I. So we went back to Fort Dix, and then I, from that, I went into the business world and uh, went with, uh, as a trainee with the Colgate Palmolive Company. Oh, yes. And uh, worked there for 10 years, and then pursued a series of other uh, assignments at uh, uh, in advertising agencies and uh, other um, marketing areas. Uh, but I, I ended my career with 15 years at Kraft Foods, and uh, that was in, uh, in the Chicago area. And uh, from that time, after retirement, went out to California again. <laughs> <laughs> went to uh, Santa Barbara. Yes. And Santa Barbara is a, a wonderful city because it's uh, got all the cultural advantages of Atlanta, but the size is much smaller and the weather is very stable. Uh, weather is always between 70 and 80 and very dry and you've got the sea and the mountains right there. Mm -hmm. You like California? Um, so you went right back to work, you didn't put the GI Bill to use? I had completed my college training. Already? Yes. See, what I did was to take a speed-up course in the summer of 1942 and then graduated in uh, January 31st, 1943, and two weeks later was in the Army. Mm. So a deferment is what I got at that point. You didn't lose any time. <laughs> um, how did the military experience influence your thinking about the war or about the military in general? I don't think it had any great impact on my thinking simply because I was doing essentially a, a, a paper job, a desk job, and to me that was uh, not too different except in the venue of uh, being uh, uh, part of the Army as opposed to being in, in business. Mm. Had, have you had a chance to keep up with any of the veterans organizations or do you attend? I don't attend any veterans organizations. I try to keep up with uh, people that I had known in Japan. Uh, it's of interest that uh, one of my classmates when I was in Japan in the fifth and sixth grades, uh, I saw him again in college. He'd never been to the United States because he'd always lived in the, there, but uh, he was a Caucasian, an American, and uh, he is now married to a Paraguayan uh, lady and lives in Quito, Ecuador, and uh, at one point in his recent history became the honorary Japanese consul for Ecuador because he spoke Japanese and uh, Spanish and English fluently. So gracious, <laughs> yes. just an example of <laughs> some of my people. Um, I think you've already answered this. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Um, your business, I, I guess I could say that I met my first wife because she sure. was a, co a uh, uh, co ed at the uh, University of Michigan, and because of the dearth of men, uh, she eventually uh, uh, decided before, I guess, through her sophomore year, that she would go into the Navy and became a wave, and as I say, became a gunnery instructor for the Navy and uh, at Fort Ord, uh, not at Fort Ord, at the uh, uh, Treasure Island. And uh, so at Treasure Island, we were, we were married in 1945, just toward the end of the war. And then you had a child. And then we had a child uh, who was born in 46. And I have three children. Mm -hmm. all, all in their 50s. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. <clears throat> One man said he didn't get a good night's sleep till his children were growing up. <laughs> you still don't get a good night's sleep because you worry about some of the stupid things that they're doing. <laughs> I don't want to miss any high points now, so um, we still have some time. Well, the high point of uh, my life was that uh, after my first wife died, uh, her younger sister, who's longtime resident in Atlanta, called up and said, uh, 
would you like to come to a party? And I said, certainly. So I came to a party at the driving club and uh, met a fine bunch of ladies and so forth, uh, couples as well as singles, but there were about six or seven singles and I had my choice. And so <laughs> we got married. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're in Atlanta, Virginia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been married 11 years. Something I was going to ask you about Japan. Well, I was so impressed that you knew them both languages. Well, I only, I speak enough so that I can get around, you know, would not be very difficult. Yeah. But, but your lack of vocabulary uh, really comes from disuse. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, <laughs> I think I remember enough just to be able to, if I were on my own, to go around Japan. It would not be good. And, of course, when you travel uh, around as we do, we go to, on a lot of trips during the year, uh, you meet Japanese tour groups. And I sidle up to somebody in the tour group that looks like you'd like to talk. And I start using my Japanese, and he immediately starts using his English because <laughs> he wants to practice, and I want to practice, and we're doing the other yeah. thing. You know what I used to wonder when I read about these terrible things that happened during the war? What do the Japanese people, how do they look on Uncle Sam nowadays, and how did they look on Uncle Sam back then? Well, uh, the, pe the populace, not talking about the army, I think have had basically a favorable opinion. Um, and of course, because they, we treated them well after MacArthur uh, signed the peace treaty, um, they were treated benevolently. And so I think uh, that carries over into the re relationship today. Let me see. What else is here? Uh, did you do any further traveling while you were in the service? Uh, no, uh, except, you know, the usual transportation wherever they send you. But no, there was no uh, extracurricular travel at that point. Well, let me see. What else do you want to add that we've not covered already? Well, I can't think of anything significant here. The military service didn't particularly affect your career. No, no. So, um, as I say, three and a half years is not. There's no, there's no impact on on civil on civilian life. You might say as a result of what I served as. If I had gone overseas, I'm sure the re reaction might have been more uh, dramatic. I didn't know they made such import. Well, how can I say that? I was surprised about the glasses. Well, to do times with change. Today, I don't think those regulations uh, no. uh, are in effect. I think if you are healthy and uh, pass their physical, uh, glasses are not a problem. In those days, of course, you know, you didn't have shatterproof glasses. That's a good point. I remember that when my kid was on his bicycle. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you have any choice about your job assignments? Or did they need to well, I had hoped, uh, as I mentioned, to get into the um, military intelligence. And I would have looked forward, because I had this Japanese experience as a child, that I would have looked forward to be in the military government. Um, I have seen uh, the Hiroshima thing. They have a wonderful museum in Hiroshima. I guess I should pronounce it Hiroshima. But uh, that shows you the impact uh, uh, on the city. The devastation was really created because the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima uh, had a parachute, and it was set to explode at 2,000 feet. And because of that, it did not hit the ground per se. It exploded, and the impact wiped out miles and miles. The photographs in the museum there just show total devastation, total devastation for miles. 
that was what it was supposed to do. Is that correct? That's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to be a killer, and it was. Today, the the shortened the war so much. Well, it did. It did. So you could say for all the lives lost in the bomb, uh, probably millions more were saved. Today there's a skeleton of the one building that seems to have survived, and uh, you've seen it probably. Uh, it's a skeletal iron which is there, and they've kept it as a memorial, even though the city has been totally rebuilt. Um, Germans had a, on that tour had a big old building with they had framed a little section so that they show the wall damage before mm. the war, but they built the rest all back. Yeah, yeah. They were doing that, showing what had happened. I guess they all of them have war memories, all countries. Well. Yeah, I've, I've been to uh, Europe and the, the Far East and seen Dachau and Auschwitz and places like that. Um, the Japanese uh, prisoner cam uh, war camps were not uh, less than at all. I mean, we all know about the, the River Kwai thing, the march from Luzon after Corregidor fell. Uh, yeah, well... Um, I I'd went to, when I was in the Philippines in 1995. <clears throat> we were taken out to the military cemetery there where my dad is buried. <clears throat> and uh, I think there are some 36,000 so graves there, half of which are unidentified. Um, but uh, I was on a tour and uh, made contact with the uh, person in charge of the camp and so was met with a golf cart when our bus got there and taken right to where he was buried, which was 50 years after he died. He had a marker. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so, just like the other s soldiers there. Mm -hmm. There were three other men, or two other men that were killed with my father because they had been also instrumental in the doing, managing, you know, as best they could. And they were executed. Mm -hmm. Must have been a very powerful moment for you. It was. I don't want to miss anything. Um, well, I don't think I have anything here that is in my short write-up. Uh, they can photocopy some of the other uh, I, if they w wish to, that's fine. I don't think she had time to decide before we started with the Well, that's okay. I mean, <laughs> I can leave this and you can, you know, use it. I'll just pick it up at some point when you're through. Well, I want to thank you so much for well, thank you. you told us. And I've always been curious about Japan and the people. And well, I suggest you go. <laughs> Well, I heard that the streets did not have the same numbering that we have, like no numbering, and I would get lost. I, I can't day. tell you about that, but there must be something magic about the way their uh, post office people know how to find something. <laughs> I had a friend who went over there. She said she went over there to study art. She went for the uh, travel experience. Mm -hmm. She said, you write down your address and somebody will help you find your way home. Mm -hmm. But she never went out except on the weekends because there was such a crowd, such a population. The nice part of my, yeah, well, the nice part of my tour was that because you not only hit big cities, but you hit small towns and so forth, we actually cir uh, circumnavigated the four islands, the four major islands of Japan which uh, are Honshu, Kyushu, Shikoku, and uh, uh, Hokkaido. Well, that was quite a tour. Yeah, uh, that was the uh, tour with the uh, talk tours, T-A-U-C-K. What was the most impressive thing about that tour that you picked up that was surprising? Oh, I guess seeing uh, the effect of the bomb because uh, that but, you know, Nagasaki was also bombed, a second bomb, and it turned out that Nagasaki was not at all destroyed because the bomb was, it did not fall where it was supposed to. Hmm. Uh, it actually fell on the other side of a mountain which uh, protected uh, the city 
and destroyed a Catholic church, but it did not uh, really have the devastation of, of on people and homes the way the one in uh, Hiroshima did. Yeah, it missed the mark. Was yeah. there a particular explanation about how that happened? Well, I never found out mm -hmm. any explanation. But it was a deciding factor, wasn't it? I think the fact that we did it twice reinforced the <laughs> the seriousness of the thing, the uh, yeah. Japan itself. Well, I want to thank you again. Well, I get so involved with this. It's such an interesting How many of you done? Uh, yeah, one little look-see here. Yep. Maybe. Your light is still blinking. I know. Is it 